in my pocket. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hi there, everyone. Uh, this is Jessica Hagman again at Alden Library, and today we have a live video interview with uh, Carmen Beecroft and Stacy Lavender, who are going to tell us about an exhibit and collection that they have been working with. Um, civil, the exhibit will be called Civil War Stories, and uh, next week they're going to talk about launching a digital archive of Civil War materials. Uh, so they're going to tell you all about that and some of the amazing materials in this collection. And um, we hope you'll be able to join us next week. So um, can we just start off with introductions first? So maybe you could tell us, um, I think you've both been on our videos before, but for anyone who's missed them, um, could you introduce yourselves and say what you do in the library? Sure. Uh, my name is Carmen Beecroft. I'm a digital projects librarian. I work in digital initiatives. Um, I image, I oversee the imaging um, of unique and rare materials from the Mon Center for uh, Archives and Special Collections, um, which is where Stacy works, and um, then I describe them and then I put them online. Uh, yeah, and I'm Stacy Lavender. Uh, I'm our special collections librarian for our manuscripts collection. So I, um, those basically are the collections that are not rare books um, and they're not university archives. So they're archival collections um, that are not specifically related to the university. So it runs a really broad gamut of topics, um, a lot of s southeastern Ohio related materials, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But basically, I just curate those collections. Um, uh, oversee their preservation needs and um, promote their use and make people aware of them. Thanks. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit about what sort of materials are in the Civil War Correspondence Collection? Yeah, um, so it's, uh, eventually it'll be um, materials from about 16, 15 or 16 different manuscript collections. Um, it's largely uh, Civil War correspondence, so letters that people wrote to each other during the war. Um, but we also have a little bit, we have several diaries like these. Um, a lot of soldiers kept little diaries while they were away, so we have um, a handful of those um, and some other military documents. This is a, you probably can't see it, but it's like a, a volunteer enrollment list where people signed up uh, to join the fight. Um, so we have some military documents. We have some medical documents. Um, a couple of the collections are people that were doctors during the war or nurses during the war. Um, so we have some medical related stuff in there too. So it's a pretty, a pretty broad range of things that are in the collections. Um, and it totals, I think, about a thousand-ish items. Um, online now we have almost 500 letters. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, so whose stories or what kind of stories are we going to find if we start looking into these collections? Um, uh, a lot of different stories. So um, the collection that's already online, the Brown Family Collection, um, it's a family writing back and forth to each other. So you have two sons that are away fighting in the war. Um, they're writing home to their mother, um, who is also writing back, to for back and forth to her brothers and sisters in other places spread out through Ohio um, and where is Stillwater? Minnesota. Minnesota. Um, so writing to family far away, writing about, um, you know, raising children and illness and traveling in that time period. So you get a lot of aspects of rural Ohio life along with stories of the war. Um, as I mentioned, we have people that were serving as doctors. So you get um, some stories about battle injuries. Um, we have people that were prisoners of war. So there are stories about being held captive. Um, also people writing back and forth to their loves. Um, we have some pretty dramatic relationships represented in this collection, romantic relationships. Um, some people split up over this. Uh, so, yeah, I, mean, I think there's a lot of different stories that are really personal and really engaging and I think will help people connect with something that was so long ago, knowing that people are experiencing the same kind of feelings that we experience today. Um, so, as you're saying, it's very personal stories, right? These aren't like, uh, you know, the stories of great leaders that we might have heard of out of the Civil War. It's very much just everyday people. So, um, what do you feel like people, what we can take away having looked at those personal stories and these kind of materials in the archives, what, what, what can we learn research-wise? Like, what, how might people use these collections? So I'll, I'll start from the big picture and then get a bit more, um, more personal, as it were. So when we think of history, where we're talking about like an infinite number of data points that are both recorded and unremarked on, they're observed and unobserved, and then history is the stories we tell um, about those things that happened um, so we need to keep going back to primary source documents to retell, reinterpret, and reimagine those stories over time as more data points are added um, to that gigantic corpus. Um, 
by looking at history from the bottom up, we can see the impact of these monolithic events as we learn about it in school, uh, these monolithic events that we learn about in school on ordinary people, how they adapted to and interacted with them, and how they reinforced or rejected these stories. Um, and finally, you know, most of us aren't famous leaders and authors. It's easier to relate to people that don't have a ton of power um, to shape their own destinies, who are just trying to do the best they can in a desperate situation. It's really about making history seem personal. So who do you see um, using this collection, either here or outside of the university? Um, well, I'm hoping it'll see a lot of use by our students. I'm hoping um, we can get it into some classroom use, um, especially since these materials are going to be available online now. I mean, people can access them at home. Professors could access them um, you know, in the classroom without me having to bring physical materials somewhere or them to come to me. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping for that. I'm also hoping anyone who's interested in the Civil War, people in the community, I think you know, there's a lot of, of areas of interest for people, so I'm hoping as many people as possible. All right, so, um, so you mentioned things are online. So how do you like get to these things online? And like how do we search them? I mean, especially since 500 things, that's a pretty big collection. How do we kind of find out what we want to see through there? So to access the digital archive, you can go straight from the library's homepage. There is a tile that says digital archives. Um, that will give you a list of all of the collections that we have. Our collection is called Civil War Correspondence. Um, clicking on that link will take you to the landing page. Um, these items are fully transcribed, so it's about 350,000 words. Um, we did preserve misspellings and alternate spellings, but this will allow you to do keyword searching within the letters. You can also search by facets, so the author and recipient um, are all available to be searched by, as well as the place where the letter was written. So um, can you, I, I've seen you both kind of, well, I've seen you tweeting about kind of discovering these stories and from the Alden Love Digital account, I know you've been kind of talking a little bit about the stories that you've seen here. Can you tell us about, I mean, you have materials here. Um, can you tell us anything about the interesting stories you came across or what kind of, um, just a little bit of an introduction to what you found? Do you want to talk about Tiny Ed? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you about something really cool that happened to me this week. So as I mentioned, the Brown family collection are the, the letters that we digitized first. Um, and it's a collection of about uh, 500, almost 500 letters um, of the Browns writing back and forth to each other. And so we have all these materials about these people. And Carmen and I, I think, both have read all these letters at this point. So we feel like we really know all the Browns. <laughs> but there's no pictures anywhere of any of them. Until this week, I was um, picking up uh, an envelope. It has Edwin, who is one of the sons. Um, who fought in the war, who is like one of my favorites in the Brown family. Um, he has his discharge papers in a little envelope and I picked it up in this teeny tiny, it, you won't be able to see it um, on the camera I'm sure, but this teeny tiny little picture of him <laughs> fell out of the envelope and I had never seen him before so it was like getting to see somebody I'd like known just, you know, virtually but not in real life. Um, not that I know him in real life now, um, but I feel like I do. Um, so we digitized that picture Carmen did yesterday. Um, so you'll be able to see Edwin in the exhibit that we have opening next week, which we haven't mentioned yet, but we have an exhibit with some of these materials opening on Monday, um, and his little picture, and perhaps a slightly blown up version of his little <laughs> picture, um, will be in the exhibit for people to see. Uh, so that was a really exciting discovery, yeah. I think, for both of us. We, we scanned that photo at 1,000 pixels per inch, so hopefully um, we'll be able to show you um, a little bit more of his expression than you can see in this um, like one and a half inch by one inch tin type snip. Yeah. It's like a large photo or a large postage stamp basically. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. It's about the size it's of really a quarter. Small. <laughs> yeah, very small. Um, so what about, so this is a diary? Yeah, this, this, is, is, yeah, this is Edwin's diary oh, okay. also. Um, we have two of them that he kept during the war. Um, and they're really interesting. Um, they can be really difficult to read because Edwin um, was less literate than some of the other letter I, writers that we have in the collection. I transcribed those. I can attest to that. <laughs> um, I really wished when I was working on it that he would spell things wrong the same way twice. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Almost never happens. It's, it's much easier if you just um, speak aloud what you're seeing on the page. He spelled phonetically and he spelled with a little bit of an accent. So. Um, yeah, so if you're definitely. talking, it makes a lot more sense than what you're looking at on the page. So that so that process then. So you said you're like so you're looking after it's been scanned, you kind of look at the document, you're reading it to yourself mm -hmm. and then transcribing it yeah. as you're 
Okay. Yes, yeah, so letter by letter, um, when possible. Um, some stuff is just illegible, um, but we did the best we could. Okay. We've done yeah. several iterations at this point, um, and we've gone over it with multiple people in order to uh, to pull out as much as we can. Okay. And so you have students probably working mm -hmm. on this too, right? A lot of students working in the digital. <laughs> Yes, um, we currently have a student doing like a final quality control um, run through of all of the letters that are currently online to remove um, character encoding artifacts. So where things suddenly turn into question marks when you um, move them from one program to another um, and also to, to um, apply her own discretion in, um, in some of the words that are unintelligible. Uh, so I've seen you tweeting about a lot of your research like into the Brown family. So what kind of other things did you do aside? Did you like go look at other materials besides what we have here or like what did you do to yeah. do that? Like, so I used um, our the library's um, institutional um, newspaper archive accounts in order to search for more information about um, specifically their deaths because there were four children in the family. Three of them died. Um, in their 20s. Um, Van died um, the earliest, he was 21, he died of smallpox during the war. Um, and then two of the other children, um, the only daughter and the youngest son, died very close to each other um, of unknown illnesses and we didn't know what happened to them. So um, I looked up their obituaries. Luckily, their uncle used to own the Athens Messenger. So oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, their, their stories were perhaps better reflected in print than other people um, in Athens County. Okay. Um, but so speaking of Nelson Van Voorhees and the Athens Messenger, um, he um, is very um, integral to the story of one of the people that we'll be highlighting in the exhibit who is not going to be part of the digital collection, but is very important to um, the Civil War in Athens County and how we remember the war. His name was Milton Holland. He was born a slave in Texas. His father was his owner. Um, when he was 11 years old, um, his father sent him north to Albany, uh, which is also in Athens County. He um, worked for Nelson Van Voorhees um, when war broke out because he was 16 and he was too young to serve as a soldier. And when he turned 18, he returned to Athens and raised a company of 149 um, other African-American young men at the Athens County Fairgrounds. And they became company C of the 5th United States um, Colored Infantry, I think it was, yeah. And they went on to, Milton went on to win the um, Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, he was promoted on the battlefield to captain and then demoted um, because of his race. Um, and while he was serving in the war, he was writing letters to Nelson, who then published them in the Athens Messenger. And so we have a very good idea of what he was experiencing as he was experiencing it because of that relationship. And I saw your, your tweet about his mother's yeah. grave. I, yeah, was... like I, I found several sources um, when I was doing research on him that says, mom is unidentified, she was a slave. We can't find any information on her. She's buried right next to his brother with you know, our mother, uh, Matilda Holland. <laughs> and um, so I corrected the Wikipedia page for that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of digital information that yeah. I see in action there. So I love this like idea that you're, you're not only just making these materials online, but you're also adding to our knowledge about these ideas. Like I don't think, um, I mean, as someone who's not an archivist or works in digital collections, it's probably not something I would have thought of as the work you know, the immense amount of work that goes into making this accessible to people and as much, um, giving as much information as possible so people can do their research. Um, how long have you been working on this? It's been, what, like year, months? And, uh, many months, I'm sure. It was yeah. identified, yeah. When we first um, started working here as digital projects librarians, it was identified as one of the priorities um, for us to get started on because um, um, the letters were rights issue three, they were in the public domain, um, and because the format was conducive to the scanning equipment that we have, it was easier to put the letters on a flatbed scanner and okay. try and photograph um, a bound volume. Okay. So we've been working on this about a year. Yeah, that was last yeah. August, so yeah. Is that August pretty August much since yeah. you got here? Yeah. 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 And, okay. and planning, scanning, describing, um, and then building the digital collection and um, ingesting and adding these items to it. 
Um, you had said that Edwin was your favorite Brown. Can you tell me why that is? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, to me, he comes across as the the sweetest of the Browns. His letters, he's always really homesick and lonely. Um, I think he has a hard time in the war. He doesn't like being there. Um, he's one of the ones that has a really dramatic uh, relationship um, with his fiance. Um, that, uh, spoiler alert, it does not work out. Um, and she, I don't like her, so it makes me like him <laughs> even more. Um, I don't know, I just, I think you read, you know, 200 letters by somebody and you kind of develop, and if, either you love them or you hate them by the end of it, I think. Yeah, that was definitely my experience as well. There's some people that we complained about a lot. Yeah. Um, I think you, at one point you told me that they, they talked a lot about health. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> the health details are amazing. Especially one person. Um, her name was Jane. She was Elmira Brown, so like the main focus of the Brown family collection's sister. And she talks a lot about the digestive problems <laughs> of her immediate family and the horrific broken leg of her son. And yeah. just lots of detail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the amount of information I know about people's bowel habits from the 1860s now is really shocking. <laughs> it's not something you would think about. Yeah. But I guess that, that means that, like, you could even, from, like, a health, public health, not public health, but a health perspective, mm -hmm. like, what is medicine and, like, yeah. discussions of health yeah. look like at that time? Like, Speaking yeah, of absolutely. health, yes, um, this is another item that will be um, in the exhibit. Um, and we will be photographing the covers um, and uh, some of the other salient details um, of this book for the published Spidey collection. Um, but this is Hospital Sketches by Louisa May Alcott. Um, she wrote Little Women. Um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. She actually served as a volunteer nurse for six weeks during the Civil War. Um, she contracted typhoid fever and was treated with mercury, which affected her for the rest of her life. But the protagonist um, of Hospital Sketches is named Tribulation Periwinkle, um, which <laughs> I, yeah, which is a which is a detail that I think is um, um, particularly interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great name. fun fact. Anyway, okay. Uh, so I so just as you're talking about these kind of personal, <coughs> you, did you find that you ever thought about like how this is maybe similar or different to how we communicate now? And like I keep seeing the shades of like. You can't believe I can't believe what that person posted on Facebook in the same way. Like I can't believe what that person wrote in the letter. Like obviously it's different, but do you feel like there are any kind of yeah parallels to kind of how we communicate now? Especially how letters were passed on after they got to the initial recipient. Um, there's a lot of letters in the collection where somebody says, "Please don't read this out loud," because that was often how everybody would gather around. The letter would be read out loud. It was like the person was in the room. A lot of them um, used that language. So they would say, please don't read this out loud, don't give this to so-and-so, or um, burn this burn letter. letter. Yeah, there's oh, wow. a lot of, um, just destroy this after you read it. There's one um, very creative example in the collection where um, a person wrote a letter in ink, then turned the letter upside down and wrote in pencil between the lines a secret message and then said just erase the pencil marks. And they did, uh, kind of. So I was able to like reconstruct some of what she wrote. She's mostly just complaining about this person that she doesn't like who's living with them. but. Um, yeah, all sorts of petty secrets um, and um, gossip. Um, and obviously, people didn't burn their letters. They did pass them on, and that's how we have them today. <laughs> Do you think there's any um, any obvious things missing? Like, can you see any reference to like a letter that you just wasn't in the collection, or do you feel like they were they were the type that really saved everything? Uh, I think there's tons and tons that's missing, yeah. um, especially since because the mail service was so um, un spotty and hard to do with the Civil War going on. So, I mean, you'll have, you know, Edwin, for example, saying, you know, it's been six months and I haven't gotten a letter. That, that's probably long, but like two or three months and I haven't gotten a letter from you guys. And you know Almira's at home writing every week and, um, you know, she'll say, I've sent you ten letters and why haven't you gotten any? So, I, I know that there a lot was getting lost in translation that way. Um, I would imagine just based on the volume of letters that the letters that made it they probably mostly kept mm -hmm. um would be my gut feeling but i mean yeah there's definitely gaps and if somebody did burn a letter we obviously don't have yeah it. that's true we I mean, wouldn't yeah, even know did. that we don't have it right, right. yeah okay so um you've got an exhibit that you're putting up later this week right yes. and then yes. um you have an event coming up next week so mm -hmm. could you tell us about those yeah so the exhibit will be up on the fifth floor um of Alden Library from September 18th to December 15th, 2017. Um, it's a whole room, yeah. so we have um, 
a selection of letters from the digital collection, um, and we're terming that side of the room the living the war mm -hmm. experience, and then we have the remembering the war experience, where we're drawing on these rare books from also from the Mon Center collections, um, and this um, the the juxtaposition of of living and remembering, and how we remember what remember you know what stories. Um, get passed on and, and who or what gets forgotten is, um, is um, very important to um, the research process um, and becoming a scholar and a historian. Um, and it's also in the news right now. Yeah. Uh, and the event is yes. on um, next Tuesday, the 19th at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be on the fourth floor of Alton. Um, and so at that event, we'll talk a little bit about the collection, and then we're also going to have some live readings of some of the letters from the Brown family. Um, so hopefully people can get a, a real feel for how personal and dramatic and interesting uh, these letters are, getting to hear some of them read out loud. And then after that, we're going to have um, an activity where people can write their own Civil War era letters. We'll have some stationery from the period and fountain pens and sealing wax. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So um, we will have um, student actors and professors from the theater department reading these letters out loud. So you'll get a very dramatic um, in, in interpretation of these events, hopefully. Yes. Um, and we just think it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. So I guess one last thing before we go. Um, what would you say is your favorite or most interesting item or kind of thing that you encounter? I feel like I'm putting you on the spot a little bit because it's 500 things. But if you can think of... There's one thing that you would say people just have to see. It's the most exciting or interesting. I'm just going to keep talking and give them a little more time to say that. Wow. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but Paul Lawrence Dunbar, um, who is the poet who is very famous for his poem, We Wear the Mask, um, was born in Ohio. Um, his parents were both born slaves. His father escaped from slavery after the Emancipation Proclamation and became um, a soldier in the Union Army. And so Paul was born um, 20 years after the war ended, but he keeps coming back again and again um, to the sacrifice of black troops during the war. Um, and uh, this uh, particular item um, is a collaboration um, that he did with one of the uh, most famous commercial artists of the day, Margaret Armstrong, whom you will see in the Publishers Binding Collection and the Hampton Institute Camera Club. So they're poems that are all illustrated um, with stage photography. And he um, has this beautiful, beautifully um, staged poem um, about soldiers um, marching off to war. And so it's going to be really interesting to um, to delve into this story a bit more and show both the anachronisms, like for example, in this famous photo, this guy is wearing loafers um, and his uniform, um, and also to um, to discuss the reasons that um, Dunbar used the writing style that he did um, and how even in a very white-dominated um, publishing industry, he was able to be subversive in some manner. There are so many stories. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> really, you could spend like your whole life just writing research or doing research on yeah. this collection. Yeah, you yeah. absolutely could. Unfortunately, we, we have jobs. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. We have day jobs, but. All right, Stacey, so you your turn. Oh, yeah. Um, mine's not going to be that good. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell another um, item that I had the same sort of like visceral response as when I found the little tiny Edwin picture. Um, there's another collection in here, uh, it's the William <laughs> McKnight collection um, and he was another uh, soldier that fought and he and his wife wrote back and forth uh, to each other while he was away um, and they from the letters that they're just were clearly very much in love they're really romantic letters and they really miss each other a lot um, and he ended up being killed in battle and so I found there's a poem that he had written for her um, this you know really sweet like not particularly you know well written poem but like the the idea is just so, so sweet. Um, and it was apparently found on his body when he died. Um, and it looks like there's like blood stains on it. And when I, I found it in the uh, in the back and I was reading it and I realized what it was, there was a little note with it that said found with his body. It actually made me cry, which, um, you know, doesn't happen to me every day in the archives. But so that, that was a particularly, I think, moving moment for me with these materials. Wow, that yeah. is amazing. Like just the personal, yeah, yes, that's not a word, but the, of that story, but yeah, the, the wow. intimacy and like yeah, the, the intimacy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was really, yeah, yeah really moving. Wow. 
Okay, well, on that note, um, we hope that you will join us for the event next week, Tuesday at 2 yes. on the fourth floor, or when you get a chance, come visit the exhibit on the fifth floor, or take a look at the materials that are available online. If you have any questions, of course, you can always put them on Facebook, or you can um, we'll pass them on to Stacy and Carmen, who, of course, know the most about this collection. Uh, but thank you so much for watching, and we will talk to you soon.